Thank you, Don, for that very kind introduction and Golan. And thank you for the Studio for Creative Inquiry for making this possible. Center for the Arts and Society. Yeah, Center for Arts and Society, who gave me a home way back in the day when I was here for about a year as a postdoc. So I'm still grateful for that, too. That was a great year and a great experience for me get, trying to get things going. So it's really good to be back. Um, so let's just start with this image. This is an image from a couple of days ago in Philadelphia, some street art. And why does it work? Why Wonder Woman? Why not Superman or Spider-Man, right? And I mean, I get it, it's a pop culture image, but, but why Wonder Woman? Uh, I would say because it addresses issues of misogyny, like to pick that particular that particular superhero. And it sets up the other figure as a supervillain. When you have the superhero punching someone, we accept that that's the supervillain. So this is a pretty nice, succinct, elegant bit of street art for political purposes, right? And it's calculated in a nice way. And taking a symbol and being real specific about it, choosing the choosing the superhero really specifically and drawing on a character that everybody knows pretty universally in the culture. Um, as cultural gorillas, we actually have to take what we find and use it as best we can. Um, the way Brecht put it, uh, I'm going to paraphrase badly, but Brecht was saying, you know, as artists and activists, we have the choice, you know, there's this definite cultural wind and the water's being pushed along if you're in your boat in the cultural ocean. And you can either row against the current and move very slowly, or you can just give up and go with the current and you're not changing anything, but you can certainly go faster that way. But if you know how to tack your sails, a good sailor knows how to go on diagonals and use the energy of that wind, but go in a different direction that you want to go in. And I think some of what we're going to talk about tonight, about tactical performance as I call it, is the idea of seeing what the energy is out there. What's What do people understand? And they can read quite well already. And then detouring it as the situation is said, uh, you know, to rework it and make it something that will go towards your purposes. So Wonder Woman punching this guy. Okay, um, the example I want to give is just something I helped to brainstorm and work on was an intervention from years ago during the battle to pass the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. See, now they're getting rid of it, but this was back before it existed. And um, the uh, insurance companies were having a meeting on their own, a closed meeting, to sort of work with their main strategist to figure out what was their cultural battle, what were their techniques for multi-million dollar ad campaigns to stop Obamacare from being passed. And we decided, listen, we can get in there somehow. We can infiltrate. Um, what, how do, what do we make of the moment? And how do we tell our story? And how do we be not the obvious and cliched approach? How can we be a little bit, try to be a little bit charming? And there's something similar. There's no punching involved. I'm going to tell you that. But it does involve, um, we, our, our desire was to get into the media, right? Our desire was to, with a budget of a few hundred dollars, actually be able to get a few million dollars worth of coverage for our side. We actually wanted the Affordable Care Act to be passed and to advocate for something more progressive as part of it, the public option. The idea of having a little bit of it that was a government-sponsored thing, and if that flourishes and does well, let's let that gradually build up as well. Um, so here we are in Rachel Maddow being amused by it. <laughs> I, all I can say is that the fight against the health insurance industry and for health reform in America suddenly, in real time, got really, really weird and surprising. Watch this. Okay, I'm going to like move forward a little bit. Um, and I just want to explain, this guy speaking is their guru. He helped stop Hillary Clinton from reforming health care in the 90s with some really brilliant ads that he did that made everyone against what she was trying to do in the 90s. So now it's in the 2000s and they want to stop this next journey. So he's there uh, to outline some strategies. Is in the back trying to provide psychic compensation. Thank you. Um. No, thank you for killing the public option and blocking any hopes of its adoption. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 
singers, let's hear it for the A-Hip singers. Those weren't the A-Hip singers. Obviously, they were the billionaires for wealth care. Again, the satirists who cheerfully and in really good tone nailed the health insurance industry today for opposing health reform. Okay, now we, we then tried, the point was to earn a moment and to drive traffic towards our website. She plugs the website, the Billionaires for Wealth Care uh, website, which gave a lot of policy analysis and kind of sarcastic and ironic uh, positions too. Uh, again, this was a guerrilla musical. And what was the song? Tomorrow from Annie. Yes, a lot of you know it, right? So this is something that many, many, many people knew. It's like using Wonder Woman, right? Um, it's the same basic idea, just a lot more labor intensive. So um, in fact, we had a guy who had written a whole song for this action months ahead of time. And a couple of days before the action was like, uh, maybe we should just use Annie, sorry, because it is this universally known thing. Let's change the words. People have been doing that for thousands of years in creative resistance. Take a popular thing and change it. And um, we earned a moment in the sense we amused Rachel Maddow. Wolf Blitzer actually started his segment on it with a clip from the real Annie in case you didn't get it, which you're like, thank you. Thanks, Wolf. And then he did a whole spot about what we had done and why. And again, people going to the website, maybe taking more action. And... Uh, some of the techniques behind this I should just get into. I get into more detail in the book, but um, how do you get in there? Social camouflage. It's a little harder probably now. Once you do it, you have to think of new new ways to do it. Um, but also the way that you document something like this, you have to have some people who don't reveal themselves, some people who just take out their smartphones and are just as bemused by it as everyone else and just take the video on their phones and afterwards just kind of gradually walk out and then run to our secret bunker and make the edit and send it to the media, right? Once you get it to these gatekeepers of the media, if you've made a nice edit, you're making it labor, less labor intensive for them that day. They don't have to work very hard that day to cover your, your thing. And that's part of the technique or the tactic of it. Um, and uh, I want to move on to some other examples. This was one that was kind of a spectacular involved action, kind of infiltration action. The naughtiness of it or the transgression of it is part of what makes it sell, uh, to make our point. Um, and that was that was part of how it's created. But also that first moment, I just, in terms of dramaturgy, the first moment where the first person stands up, the first singer, she's singing his praises. She's not attacking him yet, the first character. Why? Because you've earned this sacred moment. You snuck in there. You have a bunch of people in there. Don't blow it on a cliched reaction. Create that moment of holy weirdness where this woman's just standing up and just can't help it. She's just singing his praises. It confuses the security for a little while. They're, they're, a few, they're thrown off on their back foot for a few seconds so you can finish the song. Um, and it also just opens people's minds. The other delegates and corporate people don't know necessarily what's happening. So the neural network's a little bit confused. And what's happened? It's not a typical protest. Maybe she's She's just so excited to be here. I don't know. And then another person stands up and another. Now you've got the typical musical argument, like from musical songs, to the point where by the time the fifth person stands up, if I was one of them, I'd be like, am I the only corporate person here? Is everyone else a singer? What's happening? You want to create that playful surprise or confusion. I want to get into a couple more, more earnest examples in a second of just creative resistance that are straightforward. And again, using very well-known sites uh, or, or symbols in work. This is very straightforward. Some of you maybe saw this right after the inauguration. Some folks said, well, we can't actually get right near the White House. That's impossible. Well, from the right angle, if we hang it back here from this crane, then people will see it, right? And that was clever. It was less risky than trying to do something right by the, the White House. Um, this was also very recent. Some of you might have seen this. this what, the Statue of Liberty, it's this universal symbol. It represents welcome immigrants and liberty, et cetera. Some folks managed to hang it from there. Doing it at that site was uh, magnified the message in that sense, playing on the popular imagination. This mask to me symbolizes a lot of what we're talking about. So I was part of a group called Reclaim the Streets many years ago in New York. We believed in festive and carnivalesque party kind of protests. And we said, look, we're gonna do this big action in DC. 
And we have all these really cheap <laughs> post-Soviet empire gas masks that we bought in surplus. And everyone has one. This is great. So if they tear gas us, we can keep partying in the streets in the clouds of tear gas. It's going to look so great. And we'll keep going. But because we're also a culturally infused group, like we're worried about the cultural struggle as much as just that, the, the quote unquote practical side, we see the cultural side as part of the practicality. They, there's, no, there's a false binary between the two. So somebody said, look, if we're wearing these military gas masks, yeah, it's practical, but we also look a little bit like maniacs. Our individually individuality is gone. You can't see our facial expressions. Uh, we're just going to look threatening. It's not the story we want to tell. Even if the facts that we're putting out to the media are correct, we just don't, it doesn't look right. So somebody, I wish it was me, it was Leslie Kaufman, she said, listen, um, let's make them fabulous. So we have all of these masks become theater masks. They're all decorated individually. They're all wonderful in their own ways. And it's almost to me a totem of what this kind of movement is about. And um, we never got to do the action because of 9-11. Yeah, so that's how long ago this is. So I think this is an idea that should happen now. Um, on inauguration day, I was part of a group that said, all right, Uber, the corporation is, it, this is a very straightforward action. Uber's collaborating with Trump. Their, their leader is on Trump's economic council and their main headquarters is right here in San Francisco. So we created sort of a human daisy chain. We locked ourselves to each other, a human charm bracelet, if you will. And we kind of locked all around uh, the building and shut it down before the start of work on the day of inauguration. And we closed Market Street with this very easy to read, understandable message. There's no humor to it yet. There's nothing. It's very straightforward. But here we are, a bunch of us, inclu myself included, just blocking, right? Just blocking the, the, all entrances in this nonviolent way. It even says resist on the lock boxes with which we lock ourselves to each other. It was just a way through nonviolent disruption to show a performance of commitment. We were prepared to be arrested for this, and that just shows a certain amount of it's performing commitment to the public. And then when asked, we can talk about why we're doing it. It got sort of national coverage. And then through some clumsy moves that Uber then made afterwards, one thing led to another, and about a week and a half later, the CEO of Uber steps down off of Trump's council. So, you know, bias alert, that's where I'm coming from. I'm happy wherever y'all are coming from, but why disguise it? We've considered this a very small, modest tactical victory, but our budget was a couple hundred dollars. So we were, we were pleased with the outcome. Clear messaging and, and performance of commitment. Um, yeah, so the book that I'm talking about is basically something I've worked on for about 15 years on and off, and it's all about creative resistance. I'd like to come to an example that some of us may remember and some of us may not. I remember it from reading about it, um, but the Alcatraz occupation. So now that I live in the Northern California, for me now this is a part of the local history, but it did make international history. And a group that of uh, indigenous people, Native Americans, who called themselves the Indians of all tribes back in 1969, saw that Alcatraz was a worthy target. And at that time it, it was abandoned. It had been a prison, but they didn't know what they were gonna do with it yet. So it was just a ruin. And you know, now it's a museum, right? But it wasn't that yet. So the Indians of all tribes said, this is a moment. We can actually get onto the national and international spotlight if we do this action right. So they really did their homework. Why did they choose Alcatraz? I mean, one reason is that Alcatraz is infamous. It's where Al Capone was. There's movies about it. Apparently Clint Eastwood escaped from it. I don't know. I'm getting, I get confused between reality and the movies, but there's been a lot of movies about Alcatraz and it's, everyone knows about it. So if a bunch of activists take it over, people will be talking about it more than if they were in the middle of nowhere somewhere, right? So that's one reason. But there's also, again, the symbolic and the cultural and the practical. It's, it's a false division between all of these things. They did a little research and they were like, you know what? When there's federal land, there's a treaty that says when there's federal land and it's abandoned, native peoples and tribes are able to take it back. And they said, that's a good clause. We know they're not going to honor it because they've never honored a single treaty. But rhetorically and legally, we can use this as cover and we can go in there. So they did. They also prepared by forming coalitions with people like Marlon Brando, you know, like celebrities and lawyers and radical longshoremen in the union. And through a whole coalition, they got a bunch of people to make it both possible and to amplify their voice as they did these, as they took it over and for over a year and a half. Now, I, I think one of the most important things about what they did once they took it over and they, once they had earned this moment, everyone's listening to them. Who are you and why have you done this? They put out this pretty incredible proclamation. And they said, look, we're the Indians of all tribes. We are laying claim you know, to this land. 
and we want you to know we're going to let the white people have a little bit of it. And um, they can have it. It's going to be held in trust by the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs uh, to be held on in perpetuity for as long as the sun shall rise and the rivers go down to the sea, playing with the that condescending phrasing that a lot of the treaties had between the government and uh, Native American tribes, all the treaties having been broken. We will further guide the inhabitants in the proper way of living. We will offer them our religion, our education, our life ways in order to help them achieve our level of civilization and thus raise them and all their white brothers up from their savage and unhappy state. Obviously, this is just an extended critique through very, very bitter humor of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and all the racist condescension that they had experienced and betrayal, right? So that's the attention getter, and it's pretty clear, 1969. But they then make, it, it takes a darker turn. It's still this kind of bitter irony. But they say, you know, really, this is just like Indian land anyway. I mean, there's no running water. There's no uh, adequate sanitation or education or resources, right, et cetera. The land's not productive, things on them. And it, it escalates usually uh, to the point of physical violence. They're attacking them just for sitting there. Act three, the all-white police force shows up. And the bitter twist at the end of this drama that's been set up by the activists knowingly is that these white police show up and they arrest the wrong people. Again, by any human standard, they arrest the people who've been getting beaten, not the attackers, right? If you're sympathetic with white supremacy, if you're with that system or if you live there, you, you there's no surprises for you, but you're not the main audience. It's not for the clans members, right? This is for the global audience who would watch and say, that is very disturbing. I'm, I'm not, that's not feeling good watching that that spectacle. It was pretty effective. Uh, it required a lot of courage and discipline. And what is getting a little more attention now, in, in I've seen it really quickly shown in a couple of movies lately, but it's not as well known as that image, is the fact that these actions were rigorously rehearsed, generally speaking. People had a great deal of discipline. They practiced in places like the Highlander Institute or just in their local church or community center. They had organizers training them to, you have to get over your fight or flight instinct in that very dangerous situation. You have to have emotional discipline and physical discipline. You have to work on it and you have to outsmart your opponents in this case, right? So here they are practicing. I think in this image, it's pretty great because if you look on the chalkboard, there's a map of the restaurant they're about to do the action in. So everything is very planned and worked out with a great deal of effort. They understand that they are outnumbered and outgunned legally in every other way. It's only white people allowed on juries. All the judges are white. Um, all the police are white. The whole situation was white supremacy, right? So you have to make the folks walk into a scenario, scenario that you've designed dramatically. And in fact, People in the civil rights movement referred to this as sociodrama. That was their term. We're going to create a sociodrama. Right? And they understood we're going to craft it in such a way that as soon as our enemy, who have become so predictable, they become so arrogant because they have the preponderance of power and force and legal authority, that kind of thing sometimes makes people predictable because they, they, you get arrogant. And we're going to, that's the only thing we have is we can think several moves ahead of them. Dr. King himself was asked on Meet the Press in uh, in 1960 uh, by a by a journalist how come you are doing this people are getting hurt it's very disruptive it's very upsetting why don't you just do those nice marches and stuff like that why don't you just stick to that stuff and very patiently uh, dr king just explained to him well you know there's a lot of people who aren't affected by this apartheid by this very oppressive system and they're not thinking about it because it doesn't affect them and so sometimes you have to dramatize the issues. So that's what we're doing. We're dramatizing the issues. And I thought that was interesting that he used that term. And so I don't need to get into all of this jargon that I've set up on this board, but I'll do some of it. Um, discipline and affect for theater people. In the, who's theater people in the audience? Some of you, right? So there's a lot of work in the theater over we have to discipline and train your emotions in order to have emotional affect on the audience. Right? That's a lot of work. This is, takes a different shape, but there was a lot of work here. Like if we discipline, before we do this activist action, if we have discipline and focus and we actually control what we're doing, we'll have a more powerful affect upon the people we're trying to change or have impact on. And I think that kind of rigor and discipline is, is really important to think about for planning actions. I talked about sociodrama, strategic dramaturgy, again, the idea of using drama uh, to, to get, some, get some power moving around. 
creative suffering actually is the is the term of the civil rights movement. They said, look, we're suffering anyway. Some people were mad because you would do this action and people would get hurt. They say, people are getting hurt every day under white supremacy. We're going to make these actions so that we win some battles and we win some legal and moral and political victories because we're suffering anyway. Let's get creative about it. The micro personal and macro geopolitical, that's a mouthful. And I don't mean to be pretentious. What I'm trying to get at with that is micro personal, the action is devised in a way that if you're watching it and you're a human and you're not already like a white supremacist, et cetera, you're going to watch it stage. It's staged in a certain way. If you look at a stage production and let's say you've come in late, you missed the first bit of the show, but what you come in and you see is there's one guy sitting on the stage on in a chair and somebody else, let's say three people come up from above and behind and just start hitting them from above and behind in the most brutal and cowardly fashion. Who are you going to empathize with? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guys? I'm using very basic terms here. Generally speaking, unless you are a sadist and they, they are, they're out there, but generally speaking, people will uh, feel for the person on the stage who's being attacked by these cowards, right? These bullies. Um, metaphorically, people who hadn't paid attention because it didn't affect them in their lives in, in the society, uh, a white person from Minneapolis, whatever, you know, they just doesn't affect their life. They turn on the TV and they see this. They're like, okay, I came in late to the story. I don't actually understand the issues, but I know who's okay and who's not okay in the situation. You know, this is drawing on literally the idea not explicitly at the time, we have mirror neurons. We can observe somebody else and have a feeling of what they're feeling. And uh, this is where empathy comes from, right? This is the micropersonal side. So that's part of the action and the way it's devised, I think, but it's also this other side. Analyzing and creating and designing your action, your action logic acknowledges this macro geopolitical stage that you're performing on as well. At the time, we're late 50s, early 60s, we're talking about the Cold War. And these folks in the civil rights movement who had no legal rights, very little money, very little of anything, frankly, they made an analysis, is this is the Cold War, what's America? We're supposedly the leader of the free world, trying to win against the Soviet Union. Part of the whole rhetorical and propaganda story is that we're the good guys. Uh, the Soviets abuse their own people, they're very inhumane, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where that twist of that third act moment where the police show up and they arrest the wrong people and take them off to jail. That's that unsettling twist ending for people watching in Sweden or France or Ghana, right? Or, you know, Australia. People who are saying, well, I'm not, this is undermining this rhetoric here. And I'm not just saying that like, well, in the abstract, there were moments where leaders of heads of state that were on America's side uh, called like JFK in the White House or early part of LBJ and said, hey, what's going on there? Do you understand that we're in the Cold War? Like, this is not good. Do you guys control what's happening in Mississippi? Is this part of your country? Is, are you taking any responsibility? It was this kind of thing happening on a lot of levels. There was a lot else of else going on. But it was this kind of thing that actually leveraged federal intervention from a federal government that had decided not to intervene against Jim Crow at that point. They're like, we'll do that eh, 10 years down the road. Who knows? We'll do it someday. And it sped up the process because of these actions. Part of what they did was putting their opponents in a decision dilemma. And a decision dilemma is just a, it's hard to do, it's hard to pull off, but your more powerful opponent, you put them in a position where whatever they do, they lose something. So they would crush these protesters and throw them in jail, right? And they would lose political points, they would get uh, lose support, uh, international support and trade, it's boycotts, all these things that would that would harm them but they would do it to uphold the law. After a number of these actions, however, some of the smarter mayors and police chiefs were like, just let them go. Don't just let them sit there. Don't do anything. We're losing too much. But there's something lost there, isn't there? They're losing their authority. Um, they're undermining the Jim Crow system by having it being broken at will. It encourages the other side. More people join because they see this happening. Um, their own side gets a little bit demoralized. And also there's this performative side when you then see the law being broken and there's nothing terrible that comes of it. In other words, people of different races are sitting down together at a lunch counter and they just sit there for a couple of hours and nobody explodes spontaneously into flames. Nobody gets cancer. You know, people who are not that into white supremacy are like, what's the big deal with this? It doesn't, why are we doing, why is that a problem? 
So to perform the world that you want to see a little bit and give a view, I think is important. And that's the transgressive and prefigurative, right? Transgressive, you're breaking the law or the norm in front of everybody, in front of the world to show what you're against. Prefigurative is you are performing a little view of what you are for and what you want in the world. If you can devise an action that does both, I think it's this hybridity that is very effective. A vision of the world you want to see. Very often I've heard people just, maybe it's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction, but they'll critique protesters saying, oh, you're always complaining, you're against everything, what are you for? It's very, it's not that hard to like devise an action that shows what you're for as well as what you're against. This is a particularly strong example. And I guess I will do the last, I said I wasn't going to do the whole thing. Let's do the whole thing. So especially because there's theater people in the audience. Emotional identification and critical distanciation. For those of you who are theater people, so Stanislavski and Brecht, right? Stanislavski, I want to have an emotionally powerful and authentic moment with the main character. We identify, you know, Meryl Streep is a genius. Whoever she's playing, I'm all for her or maybe I'm afraid of her. You know, it depends on the part. But you have this kind of idea of emotional this very authentic, emotionally compelling moments that motivate you. And Brecht was against this, and he spoke about critical distanciation. He's like, I want emotions for sure, but I want you to be sitting back and entertained in this intellectual way where you're understanding the points and you're critical of the decisions made and thinking about the flaws in the system, et cetera. And to me, this kind of action does both. I think that you certainly have an emotional affect in watching these spectacles of racist cruelty if you have any empathy. But because of that twist ending that's not resolved, the state arrests the wrong people and whisks them away, um, you've got that critical distanciation moment too of, wait a minute, that's not that's unsettling. I'm not feeling catharsis. I have to get catharsis through action in the real world. I have to do something about this, right? Which a lot of people did by giving money or getting on a bus and becoming a freedom rider. Everyone did different things, volunteering, legal service. People found their catharsis through action. And to me, this is almost like Brecht and Stanislavski, these rivals holding hands and walking together towards the horizon, towards a better future, et cetera. The actions are well rehearsed and disciplined. They're thought, of, they're thought of in a way to tell the story. There's a specific, specificity of target and of action. The action is about what it's about. Sometimes we get upset and we say, let's block the highway. And I've noticed, like, no matter what the issue is, let's block the highway, uh, at least uh, where I live. And so I understand, right, I get it, because you're saying, you're saying no business as usual. You can't do X or we're going to shut it down. You can't do Z or we're going to shut it down or A or B. And whatever you're doing, we're going to shut it down, all right? But I think it can be powerful, too, to think about specificity like we try to do in the theater um, and to say, OK, uh, let's blockade a target that tells you the story specifically of what we're against and what we're for. And this happened a little while ago when some uh, activists in response to racist cruelty and brutality in Oakland, they blockaded the Oakland Police Department. And that was scarier, uh, in a sense, than blocking the highway. But it's certainly the symbolism was very clear, right? doesn't have to always be that way, but I think it's important. A lot of this boils down to raising the cost of repression. I don't think you can prevent the authorities from being repressive. That's kind of their choice, isn't it? But you can make it politically more expensive, right? Right? I wish it wasn't true. It's frustrating, but there we are. I, I think that cliche kills a lot in movies. It kills a lot of joy in poetry, in music. Uh, and then I think it also can harm the efficacy of protest. Uh, I think avoiding cliche. You know, how many people have heard this chant if you've ever been to anything? Hey, hey, ho, ho. Hey, hey, ho, ho. And something got to get right. You know what I mean? So we used to. I don't even bother doing this anymore. We used to just show up and be like, hey, hey, ho, ho, hey, hey, ho, ho has got to go <laughs> and just like, and try to start something else because it's like we're really, it's not compelling. That's all we're saying. We're not trying to be mean. It's just not good. All right. But that stands in for me for a lot of different things when we say, let's do the same thing again. And but it's like, well, if it's worth doing, can we be a little surprising? And I think we try to talk in the theater about how surprise can earn you a moment. Um, and I think it's true in action. Okay, enough of that. Um, when we 
talk about the most recent Standing Rock confrontation, I think there's a lot of going on along these lines. It was a performance of deep commitment. There were some folks who finally started paying attention just because they were like, those folks are in the cold for how many months? Maybe I should actually Google this, you know, at least read about what it's about. So that persistence, I think, actually matters in terms of being compelling to people who are not already on your side. But I think they also successively, the organizers, first of all, the it was led by the frontline community. And I think that's important. It was led by the people of color, the indigenous communities who were directly affected. Let other people who have a little more privilege come in in a supporting role, not try to bogart the mic and take it over and, and make it about themselves. I think they did that pretty well. And the action connected many different issues, so many different people had a way in. There was indigenous rights, you know, tribal sovereignty, climate change, environmental racism. A lot of these different groups, a coalition could come together because they successfully joined uh, all these and linked all these issues. So of course now there was a temporary victory under Obama. Now it's a temporary, I think, a, I hope a temporary setback, but I think enough connections were made with the water protectors and others that I don't think it's over yet. One of the turning points being, of course, for those of you who were following it, when the veterans showed up, right? Why? What's so important about veterans? Well, it's the United States of America. We love our veterans, right? We love the army and the military, and we, the veterans are pretty sacrosanct. In other protest movements, when the veterans got political, it really helped because of their inherent legitimacy in our culture, right? So when the bunch of them showed up, it was really quite something. However, I appreciated the political sensitivity and savvy of those veterans. And how many people saw the apology ceremony on, on YouTube? A couple people? Two people? Or three people? A few. Okay, good. So there was this moment where these folks showed up and they were like, you know, there's a really bad tradition in American culture of the cavalry coming to save the day. But in those movies, the Native Americans are the bad people. Let's try to think about this a bit and let's not make it that we're the saviors. It's, it would just not be the right way to do this. So they showed up being willing to put their bodies on the line, certainly raising the cost of repression because when private security starts shooting and, and maiming and wounding people who fought in Iraq, that's not going to go well, right? So it was wonderful that they were there, but they did, and you can look it up on YouTube, they did this ceremony. It was it was brief, it was eloquent, it was succinct, it's like a few minutes long, but they got up there and they acknowledged the history of the United States military in genocide and the plundering of Native peoples, and they apologized and to the tribal elders who then also said some very generous and forgiving words and bringing people together. It was acknowledging instead of overriding that oppression and saying, now we're gonna perform coalition together. And it's very moving if you check it out. Um, and that was not just for them, it certainly was for them, uh, but I think it was also for the national audience to see, right? And uh, I think it makes for a deeper and stronger movement when that's articulated in that moment. Okay, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the clown army. Um, uh, I always like talking about the clown army. I'll see if you agree. So this was a very strange thing that we started in Britain years ago. And the idea was to f join somehow in this strange hybridity, um, Nonviolent civil disobedience, clowning, performance art, theater of the oppressed, a, a bunch, it was kind of a mishmash of ideas. And we we're like, let's create something. You can't use it in every confrontation, but let's create an army of clowns that can be mediagenic, like a, attract attention, but can also contain a critique and have a specificity of, of critique. But maybe most importantly, just be unpredictable and our opponents won't, or our dance partners won't necessarily be trained right away in how to deal with it. So this is during a protest in Scotland against the G8. It was the G8 at the time. And we're just trying to take the road and blockade it and uh, get the attention of people against the G8's policies. But first we have to deal with the fact that we're being knocked off the street. Oh, 
really scrub it? Oh yeah. That's right. Oh, oh, You know what we're here for? Okay, so, you know, and now for something completely different. But, you know, like, they weren't trained for that. You saw that armored boot and the armor and the weaponry and everything. Like, they're ready for you to, like, let's fight. Sure, let's fight. Great, right? Uh, but what about this, right? That boot was not clown-proof. You could just scrub at it with a little feather duster, and he's like, okay, thanks. Right? Right? And they start to crack up themselves. They thought they were going to have a much worse day. The police thought they were going to have a much less pleasant day, right? And eventually it's just time to leave because what, what's happening? What the hell is happening? What are they doing? Right? We, I can imagine the conversation. Uh, we either need backup. Do you, we have any clowns? You know, like <laughs> bring some clowns in here, you know, or just leave. And again, we got to keep the street and do what we're doing. And then the media had accumulated because that's just weird. The media is not necessarily on their side, but it's interesting. So they're going to come and then we can say what we want to say. We had our clown names, corporal punishment, private property, general strike. I was kernel of truth. And I usually was the media. I would be providing the kernel of truth for the madness. Like, why are you out here doing this? And a lot of it was trying to figure out through clown logic how to get our critique of things like AIDS research policy and funding or debt, you know, the IMF's policies, to get those things out through this kind of clown logic. There's nothing more satisfying than when you read in a really uh, big corporate media thing something that says, the clown claimed, and then quote, and then it's like what you wanted to say. It's nice. But part of this gets at this idea that I try, I'm trying to formulate of the irresistible image. And we were trying also to just, in general, rehumanize the global justice movement. There had been a lot of money spent on dehumanizing the global justice movement. Like, if you're one of those protesters, you're a nihilist, and you're going to set things on fire and, I don't know, kill people's cats. I don't know what the point is, but, like, no, we're actually out here for a reason, and we have, we have a point that we're trying to make. So to try to go against a lot of that noise, this was just one of many methods or attempts to create images that undermined that. So this image, which is on the cover of the book because of what it is, is from the moment I just showed you. There were a lot of people filming it and photographing it, right? And the idea is to create an image that's so irresistible that even your ideological opponents will reproduce it. They can't help themselves look at that. That is just strange. But it also is making our point in a certain, at least one of our points. So we had very reactionary papers papers, right? Police one, anarchist zero, you know, like they were not on our side, but they're reproducing the image on the left there, the policeman smiling, and it doesn't match what the text says. It provides this kind of reverse caption to the text that undermines the ideology of the dominant press. This is another example. Here's another one. And it's a little bit of a sort of a political Aikido. You take the momentum of your opponent and just gently move it in a different direction. Um, I'll skip some of these just for time. That's the billionaires for Bush. Small government, big wars was our slogan. Okay. This is the oil enforcement agency, the skull and cross gas pumps. We actually created a federal agency to uh, raid places where oil was being abused, like the DEA, but uh, better. Um, and uh, that was surprising in its moment. Um, I'm going to go past this. I just want to share this image because I feel that there's something to it where if you don't happen to have a lot of time, this guy just had a Sharpie in a dream and he saw something happen. See, it doesn't always have to be our ridiculous things that take months to put together. Okay. But um, if I can come to this, 
performing the censored image. No, so some of the actions that I'm sharing with you are kind of funny. You know, the clowns are trying to be very serious. It's serious play, but it's playful. But of course, you have, like in the theater, all the different emotions on the palette accessible to you. In this case, G.W. Bush um, outlawed the photographing of coffins coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan with the flags on them, you know. It was an image that wasn't good for them. Some folks said, hey, that's unconstitutional. We, we got to fight that in the courts. You can't tell the journalist not to take pictures of that. But that takes years to win. And in fact, it took so many years that just Obama became president later and undid that executive order before it could get overruled in the courts. So in the meantime, some thoughtful artist activists just made a thousand cardboard coffins and they marched them through the streets, right? And they just started working with progressive activist groups uh, progressive veterans groups, I should say, and created these kinds of moments. And the act, working with progressive veterans groups gives you more information, a little more expertise on the issue, more legitimacy, I would say, uh, to people who are not already on your side because of that thing in the culture about the veterans. And also the veterans could teach them how to do things in straight lines, which they were not very good at before. So this was better. And again, it's getting the kind of attention even from media outlets that are not necessarily on your side because it's compelling front page kind of coverage. So we're looking for pressure points. I would say like there's that pressure points on the body kind of acupressure idea. We're looking for pressure points on the body politic. We don't have a lot of resources or influence or power just off the cuff. We don't have a cable news station that's like our propaganda venue. So how do you find these moments? Um, I think we're close, how are we we're doing for time? Like. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to show one last thing, maybe, and then we'll be Q and A or something because you're getting close. Okay. So this was just a ridiculous thing I did, so I'm going to share it at, for the end. And it's the kind of intervention we try to do with street theater. I had some friends blockading the Wells Fargo headquarters in San Francisco because of a lot of terrible things they were doing, and they told me what those terrible things were. I didn't know, and they said, "Could you do some shtick?" just so people walking by don't just hate on us the way people hate on protesters and blockaders. And, oh, you're inconveniencing me. So I was like, yeah, yeah, no, it's terrible what you guys are doing. I bet you there's not going to be any bankers there. To, you know, they're going to be underrepresented at the protest, and that's not fair. So I wanted to, like, find a way to tell the story in the, in the right way. Hi. Um, this is really upsetting. I don't know if you know what's going on here, but there's, like, a blockade of people. Uh, I work for Wells Fargo. I'm a banker. They're not letting me in. And I, you know, I'm a productive member of society. I have a job. Hello. And uh, they're not letting me in to do my job. And I have like 63 foreclosures to process today. I have 32 small business loans to reject. That is a lot of paperwork. I'm also on the tax evasion committee because we don't pay our taxes in Oakland. That's very hard to justify and it takes a lot of strategy. So I have a lot of work to do. These people are stopping me from, look at these people. And I want to show you like my job just so people can understand this. This is my job. Basically, um, here's a house and there's a family there and they live in there. And then I kick them out onto the street and then they're cold and shivering. It's sort of a Keith Haring effect that I'm going for. And that's my job. And that's what I do. And they're not allowing me to do my job today. It's, it's, it's not a good day in America. Okay. So... There it is. It's ridiculous, right? But it's just quick. It's clear. You don't walk away feeling deceived. It just gets more ridiculous to the point where we're all in on the joke together. Maybe it seems real for five seconds. And then the next 10, you're like, no. And then it's just stupid, right? But the point is to tell the story, you know? Um, so there's a lot of other things I could share, but I'm thinking maybe it's time for Q&A, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you.